And so, as I mentioned, welcome. Um, the title of our webinar today is Beyond Entering Results, Taking Action, Making Improvements, and Telling Your Story. And I don't know about you, but um, at my own previous institution, we often faced the challenge of collecting assessment data and then putting that assessment data on the proverbial shelf um, and congratulating ourselves on a job well done. Uh, it's always been a struggle to then use that data to make improvements. And that is the challenge that we face. Uh, it's um, what we're called to do as assessment professionals, but it's also part of our role as educators and serving our students well, um, is being good stewards of the data that we have and making sure that it's being put to use to better their experiences at our institutions. So today we have two presenters who are going to share their expertise and how they're doing this work at their institutions. And this is a bit of an encore performance from the um, Virginia Assessment Group Conference last fall, um, that the information was so valuable, we decided we just wanted to make sure that as many people as possible could participate in this webinar. So let me introduce to you, uh, Dr. Benji DeKing, he's the Dean of Administration at Bon Secours Memorial College of Nursing. He holds responsibility for the areas of accreditation and regulatory compliance, institutional effectiveness, safety, and physical plant operation. Benji has served as an IE consultant for many higher education institutions and has presented at the Association for Institutional Research and the Assessment Institute of Indianapolis. We also have with us Dr. Ryan Murnane. He is the Assistant VP for Academic Policy and Compliance at Regent University. He has worked in higher education assessment and accreditation for 13 years at three different institutions. He's completed an application for an institutional accreditation, an initial institutional accreditation, developed two interim fifth year reports for SAC COC, and managed re Regents reaffirmation process in 2019. Dr. Murnane has worked extensively with supporting faculty on their program learning outcome assessments and other institutional assessment and reporting. And I always get excited when I do those introductions at the wealth of experience that our WEAVE members bring to this work. And I know they have a lot of valuable information to share today. So I'm going to turn it over to first Dr. DeKang um, to tell us a little bit more about Bon Secours and then he'll hand it off to Dr. Murnane so we can hear a little bit about Regent. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Sherry, for that lovely introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to be here to not only share um, uh, our experiences, but also to learn from you, uh, courtesy of WEAVE. Um, as uh, Sherry said, I am the Dean of Administration uh, not only at Bon Secours Memorial College of Nursing, but at the uh, uh, Richmond Higher Education. In case you're wondering what that is, our parent health system, which is Bon Secours Mercy Health, owns three higher education institutions in the Richmond area, uh, that's in Virginia. Uh, bon Secours Memorial College of Nursing, um, Bon Secours uh, St. Mary's School of Medical Imaging, and Southside College of Health Sciences. For the sake of this webinar, I'll be speaking about our experiences at Bon Secours Memorial College of Nursing, uh, which for the remainder of the presentation, I'll be calling College of Nursing. Um, uh, some quick uh, information about Bon Secours Memorial College of Nursing. We do offer two programs, uh, the traditional pre-licensure uh, BSN and the uh, uh, post licensure are into BSN. There are a few facts uh, on the slide here that I will not read to you. Uh, bon School uh, College of Nursing is also uh, institutional accredited by the Accrediting Bureau of Health Education Schools, ABHES, uh, and programmatically accredited by the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, uh, CCNE. On that, I will turn it over to Dr. Mormay. Thank you. And it is great to be here, uh, seeing some familiar faces or familiar names in the chat. 
Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this weekend actually marks 10 years that I have been uh, at Regent. Um, and uh, before that, I was um, at two other institutions. One was where we were pursuing initial accreditation. And then um, and then for a second one, I was um, helping with their fifth year report. But Regent has grown substantially, almost doubled in size since I've been here. They're around 11,000 students. They have nine academic units, college and uh, schools. Uh, we are accredited by SAC COC and we have um, <clears throat> uh, seven specialized accreditations and we're pursuing one. Uh, we're pursuing ABET right now and we're hoping to submit that in the summer. Um, and my office is very involved with managing and coordinating the um, specialized accreditation reporting. So we had an ACBSP visit uh, last month and we're pursuing CAPE and KCREP. So one of the things that we try to do with WEED is we try to centralize, since all accreditations um, require some type of program learning outcome assessment, uh, we tried to ensure that we can do centralize all that through Weave. So I'm hoping that what we can do today, not only is beneficial for your institutional, formally known as regional accreditation, but also specialized accreditations as well. Thanks to both of you for that introduction, a little bit of context. And so now um, we do want to know a little bit about what brought you here. In other words, um, what happens after results are entered at your institution? And so uh, we're going to launch this poll. Uh, you should see it pop up on your screen there. We're asking um, at your institution, what happens after results are entered? And so the choices are we analyze findings, but it stops there. Um, again, that kind of proverbial shelf model. Um, we analyze findings and plan for future actions, which is kind of the gold standard. Um, nobody's quite sure we should probably figure that out. <laughs> Um, and then I left a choice for other because, uh, you know, you never know what folks are doing at their institution. So if you'll take a minute and fill out that poll, I'll let it populate here for a second. And then we'll show some results in just a minute here. Got answers coming in. <clears throat> I'll give you the, the sneak uh, rundown. Um, it looks like there's at least a few answers in every single category. And if you're one of those folks who's clicking on other, go ahead and put a note in the chat about what you mean by that, like what is happening at your institution. That'll kind of help us, help the presenters get an idea of who they're talking to and some of the challenges that you are trying to address. So. I'll give just another couple of seconds here for anybody else who wants to vote. And let's see those results there. Um, can you see the results there? Yeah, okay, so we've got, um, you know, some people who are analyzing findings, but they haven't done much more than that. We do have quite a few who said they're planning for the future um, using those assessment results, so that's great. Um, but we do have some folks in that I'm not quite sure category. So thank you for responding to the poll there. And um, from here, our plan is for a couple of minutes to hear from both institutions about um, what they are doing once they uh, gather up those assessment findings at their institution. So we'll lead off with Dr. Duquesne and then um, we'll hand it off from him to Dr. Murnane to tell us a little bit about uh, how they're using their assessment results. Thank you. Um, it, it's good to see um, that at least 29% of uh, our peer institutions, they they not, not only do the analysis, but they go beyond that and, 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 and plan for the future based on the analyses. Um, at the College of Nursing, there are three things that we do. Uh, first off, we make sense of the findings. Then we um, use those findings to inform improvement decisions. And then we tell the story of what we've been doing. Uh, so I'm going to start out with, you know, making sense of uh, findings. What do we mean by that? Um, in our assessment plan that was established in the beginning, uh, we set expectations, objectives, or goals um, 
for learning or work that had to be uh, met in the end based on some activities we were going to engage in. So those goals, objectives, or, uh, or expectations, how do, how do we meet them? It's in terms, in terms of um, targets or benchmarks that we want to see, you know, that will indicate uh, what success would look like. Um, so making sense of the findings is when we compare actual outcomes to expected outcomes. That tells us uh, whether we met our targets or benchmarks or not. Next slide, please. Then we use the findings to inform uh, improvement uh, decisions. So this is where the so what question comes in, uh, regardless of what the outcomes might be, right? Just like uh, there's no need to, to survey students or any other constituencies uh, if we're not going to use uh, the results. Uh, there's no point in engaging in assessment um, if we're not going to use the results to improve um, uh, our institution or our uh, respective units. Here I have a couple of scenarios um, that are frequent at our institution, whether we meet the target or we don't meet the target, what do we do? First, if we meet the target, there are two things that we do. Either um, we, make change, we, we make no changes to the next assessment cycle, or um, we see an opportunity to improve even though we met our targets or benchmarks. Right? Uh, and this usually comes in the form of uh, process improvement. Um, if we did not meet our targets, we have to action plan. And we action plan uh, in at least three ways. Either we make corrective action, or we adjust our assessment, or we adjust our targets. Um, th that comes in if we feel perhaps um, we were too ambitious with our targets. Next slide, please. So I, I just thought I would share an example of what we do. Uh, or, you know, once we get our results. In this case, I share an example of what happens with our No Levitz Student Satisfaction Survey, which is administered every other year to all students. Uh, for each survey item, ranging from teaching and learning to student support services to facilities uh, and safety and security, stu students are asked to rate two things. First, the importance of the item to them. And then secondly, uh, how satisfied uh, are they as it relates to that item? Once we re receive the re results of no levels, our administrative cabinet uh, comes together to make sense of them and decide what to do next. Each cabinet member is then assigned uh, action planning related to their area if necessary. Facilities management falls under me. Um, and you see on this slide what my area had to do with this particular concern from the students. Right? The students were concerned that they did not have enough space during the lunch hour to regroup. And so um, we had to come together and, and address that concern, that's for one, to decide what we will do in addressing that concern and what success will look like. And and then uh, find a way to uh, provide uh, progress updates to our campus community. So you have what we did in each of those areas on the screen. I'll give you a moment to read. And next slide, please. Then, Tell the story of the beautiful work that we've been doing um, in our respective areas. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. DeBenham Court, who I believe is still uh, one of the deans at um, the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University. She said, assessment should be a way to tell the story of what we've been doing. So. 
we make sure that we tell the story of the good work that has been happening in the respective areas of our institution. This is why indicating how assessment results will be used um, uh, is a required component of our IE plans, uh, which we call, by the way, journey of institutional effectiveness. And with that, um, I turn it over to Sherry to see if there are any questions. So we'll give it a second to see if anything pops up in the chat or the Q&A. I have a question um, referring sure. back to that, uh, S the Noel Levitz that you posted the example from, which was a, a survey many are familiar with. Um, from those survey findings, so I think that you said in 2018, you made those corrections, those actions. When will you survey again? And what do you do to kind of track and see what kind of impact your actions have taken? Uh, good point, uh, good questions. So we, uh, we, we've already surveyed uh, at least once prior to um, the, 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 the pandemic. So I believe it was in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. What we try to do, we try to survey every other year with no levels. Um, so um, as I said in, in that slide that you, uh, I posted there, we uh, action plan and then we provide a progress update uh, to our campus community uh, as to what's been doing and um, our student services, they, they have what they're called, um, uh, I forget how, how they call that. They allow students to provide feedback um, to, to our campus com community anonymous, anonymously. Um, so that is one way for us to look at the, the impact. And the other way to look at the impact is to see how well we do the next time around on those particular survey items that would have struggled in, uh, struggled on um, in the previous administration. Thank you for that. I saw a couple of folks trying to use the raise hand feature, um, but we don't have audio turned on for our participants. So if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. I'm happy to um, read those off so that our participants can respond. And um, I think we'll go ahead and, oh, well, here's one popping up there in the Q&A. Let me check this. So um, here's a question from Brittany Trafton. She said, any suggestions you would give on how to go about determining your targets? Um, and specifically, she said, who's part of the conversation for setting those? And do you look to external voices um, like people who hire your students. And so in other words, like advisory boards out in the community. So kind of a three-part question there. And I can repeat sure. any part of that if you want me to. <laughs> sure, I think I get the sense uh, of the question. That's a very good question. So um, so the, the first thing is to know, know who your customers are, who your clientele or your audience um, is in terms of the activity that you're looking to set a target for, right? And, and then based on that, you, once you make sure that you know your audience, you make sure that, um, that there are represent, that there is good representation uh, when a decision is made as to what success is going to look like. So the target is about what success is going to look like for you as, as it relates to that particular activity or item that you're trying to, um, to assess. Good, thank you. And, and um, we've got another question um, in the chat, but it <laughs> looks like, um, yes, so Teresa is asking if she'll be able to get the slides, which yes, we will have the um, recording available and you'll be able to view the slides that way. So thank you for those questions. And if you have more, please, we'll, we'll allow a couple of more um, breaks in here to try to answer those questions. And from here, uh, Ryan, we're ready to hear uh, what happens after the results are entered at Regent. Uh, excellent, thank you. Um, 
so um, Dr. DeKang did a very good job describing kind of the culture and the process. So not to be overly redundant, my approach is more of a, a person who's in an assessment office. What can we do in order to try to get a positive or a, a quality uh, response after the findings are entered. So my approach will be slightly different, but I'm hoping that it's complementary to, to what he had um, what he had discussed. Um, the first thing, though, um, um, so I was going to highlight really three things about what we try to do after results are entered. And the first thing is to communicate with internal stakeholders. Um, the first thing, though, underneath this, though, is a mindset. Uh, between being an administrator and being a manager, and I and I speak with faculty and and other assessment individuals about this a lot, where a manager is generally focused on their specific area, maybe they're a dean over a school or a director over a, a department, while an administrator, uh, at least the way I'm interpreting it, is someone who views kind of the whole institution, and so. As you're looking at this, um, the, pe the person who's managing the results, their approach to what they do with the results will really be different if they have an administrator mindset or a view of the institution versus a manager mindset of the institution. And so um, as people who are assessment professionals, we always want to take it from an administrator standpoint. But if I'm engaging with a faculty member or some other um, assessment person who's maybe a department department chair, and I'm noticing that they're approaching it from a manager standpoint, then um, I take that opportunity to train them or to help them understand while that might be beneficial in your specific context, uh, we need to think about the bigger picture of the whole university and how that's going to work. Um, and, and the other piece of this is not only training people to have a administrator mindset, but also uh, serve as a messenger across the university. Um, I, I have a little you know, image here of Paul Revere you know, going around spreading the message. Um, and so a lot of times, um, because people have that manager mindset, they're so isolated in their area that the needed information isn't getting across campus. And so I'm viewing my role and those in my office um, almost as uh, campus messengers. Uh, to go to different areas. In some cases, it's telling vice presidents or deans about missed deadlines. In other, in other cases, it's about helping them interpret the findings of what's been collected. Um, but ultimately, though, once the results are entered, many times if the faculty or the assessment individuals are just thinking as a manager and the data stops there. So our goal here in the communication piece is to change that mindset, but also serve as a manager so that all of the appropriate stakeholders who need this information is given that information. Uh, next si slide, please. So once it's up there, one of the things we would like to do is to discuss and strategize for next year's assessment plan. Um, and there's five really brief things uh, that we kind of highlight on this. Uh, the first is, you know, when we're doing this strategy for, for um, the next year's assessment, we identify assessment gaps in curriculum evolution. Regent utilizes a lot of cross-listed courses. Uh, it's always tweaking courses to address various environmental things, uh, environmental changes, you know, um, to um, uh, whether it's licensure or whatever. And so when a course change, our office and others try to ensure that there's no gaps from the assessment standpoint. We also want to audit faculty involvement and improvement. We want to make sure that faculty are involved. In fact, we did a specialized accreditation report recently, um, and the person who wrote the accreditation report, uh, Regent has been a a weave institution for like eight years where it's across campus, every program is involved with it. But the person who wrote the specialized accreditation report had never even heard of weave because the specialized accreditation person and the person who did assessment weren't communicating very well. So I came in and tried to help them understand. So um, doing an audit to see, okay, which faculty needs to be involved with this to help them understand everything that's going on. We also need to review appropriate alignment between assessments and learning outcomes. Many times faculty are hired and given certain, you know, to teach courses, and in their mind, they're just thinking about their course. So a lot of times they'll change assignments that were specifically designed to assess a learning outcome. And so as we strategize, we want to ensure that all the appropriate assignments are in place, um, even with new faculty coming in. Um, again, that's about strategizing next for the you know for the next year, but also being very proactive in our training and messaging. 
Um, and that kind of goes with the fourth point about improvement and enhancement of assignments. Many times somebody's like, you know, instead of a paper, we want to do this project or this group project. Um, and within the context of that course, that might be better. But if that paper that they're changing is linked up to a learning outcome, we then have to have a conversation of saying, okay, well, how can we make it both work for the course as well as the learning outcome? Uh, because most, most faculty are thinking as managers of their courses and not administrators in certain instances. So we wanna make sure that that is communicated as well. And then finally, how will action plans impact future ass uh, assessments? Sometimes they say things like, oh, we need to add a new course to help learning outcome A, but not realizing that by adding that course, it's affecting another course that impacts learning outcome B. So we wanna make sure we have these conversations and just keeping the, the knowledge and the thinking broad so that um, uh, so that when one thing changes or a new person comes on board, a new faculty member comes on board, we're not having to always be playing catch up later on when you know something wasn't addressed when they're trying to collect assessment data. Next slide, please. And the final thing on this is what happens after results are entered. We review and update previous action plans. Um, where are action plans stored and how are they communicated to stakeholders? Um, uh, if you are a Weave institution, you know that action plans can be stored in Weave, but many times not very many people in your institution access Weave. So how is that communicated to stakeholders? And one reason why this is important is because um, there are um, planners, those that come up with the, the action plans, approvers, which are usually like deans, finance people, faculty committees who approve the changes, and then those who implement it. <clears throat> and at times, we have found that there's been a disconnect between those three people, those three groups of people. So we want to make sure that there's a connection. So as an assessment person, <clears throat> my office and I will uh, work with faculty and say, okay, you're making this change. Great. Who needs to approve this? Who's going to ensure that it gets done? Who's going to implement it and make sure that everybody's on the same page? Another issue is uh, when action plans have to be tracked over multiple years, maybe they're going to be implementing, maybe the implementation will take multiple years. This can be difficult because many times faculty are thinking assessments are like one and done, like one year and then it's done. But maintaining this idea of, you know, going back and checking, keeping action plans live uh, could be very helpful because you don't want to then, you know, have a person writing an accreditation report talking about an action plan of improvement. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, did this ever get done? We don't know because it wasn't tracked, which then goes to the third point. Um, about um, how will your future self know if an action plan was implemented. Um, years ago, I watched the show, uh, How I Met Your Mother, and there was always kind of a running joke of if they wanted to put something off, they would say something like, oh, my future self will take care of it. And then it would fast forward and they're like, well, why did my past self? It, it, so it was kind of a running joke, but it's the same thing of, um, if you have an action plan going on now, is it, is it stored and is it uh, written clearly enough to where either you or somebody, your replacement, is knows enough about it, can read enough about it in order to know whether, you know, what the action plan was, whether it was implemented and whether or not it was effective. So thinking through all of those things now will be helpful in, in the future um, actions of your assessments. So I think you. from here, Sherry, we may, is it question time? Yeah, let's let's hold for a second and see if we get a couple of more questions in the chat. Um, I actually had one myself and also just a quick comment. I really like that analogy between the manager and the administrator. And it reminds me a little bit too of our colleague Tisha Paredes who works um, with Weave quite a bit. And she often talks about our role as an assessment salesperson versus an assessment consultant. Um, something that she desired to make a change on her campus from someone who is constantly in sales mode, trying mm -hmm. to pitch the idea of assessment versus someone who was actually providing skills and training to the departments on campus who were ready to do that work. So I, I appreciate that. My yes, question, and, yes our approach ahead. is always trying to be not compliance, but support. <clears throat> like we're trying to offer, you know, if something has to get done, like I had a meeting today with somebody and something has to get done. So my response was, well, we do a workshop. My office will do a workshop. So when you guys are ready to engage with this, please feel free to reach out to us. Instead of coming across as a compliance mindset, come across as, you know, a supportive person. 
Yeah, wonderful. So my question is, and we'll see if we get a couple of other questions in chat or Q&A, but thinking back to that faculty audit that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, is there a tool that you use for that? Do you have a you know, spreadsheet, a survey? How are you going about collecting that information? So um, w there's nothing formal. Um, I'm a very... Um, um, so my background is before higher ed was working in a church. And I remember years ago, a, pa a pastor told me to go make house calls like visits. Uh, he said, never call first, just show up. Because if you call, people are always going to say they're busy because they never want to meet with the pastor. But he's like, if you show up, they'll let you in and you'll have a good conversation. So when I want to get information from like faculty, I just walk to their office or I just do a phone call, just, and it's a friendly at first, but then I start asking questions. Um, and within that conversation, I will usually kind of take, put some feelers out. And if I'm finding that the faculty that I'm engaging with don't really know what's going on from an assessment standpoint, then when I'm meeting with the, the chair or the leader, I'll usually give some input of saying something like, hey, you might want to consider, you know, having a discussion on this. Um, so there's, we're not really doing an an official audit at this point. I've, it's more of an indirect response, um, but it's becoming fairly evident when we're doing like specialized accreditations and uh, we're finding that some faculty are not um, aware of, you know, the assessment stuff going on. It's not, it's not part of the faculty meeting and the faculty culture within those discussions. Thank you for that. Good clarification. And I, I love that, um, the analogy once again, and just pop in, you know, before they have a chance to go hide behind their uh, pulled together <laughs> window shades, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> so we did have a question come up in the Q&A. This is a great one from Sarah Haltman. And she said, do all your programs use the action plan option in Weave to track their plans? Is this something you require? And if so, do you have a narrative response to answer to the action plan? Um, so we try to, if there is a very, so first let's say if the, if the achievement target is not met, then we do expect there to be an action plan and that action plan should be written in weave. Um, that has been really the furthest we've gone from a, uh, being consistent. Um, we tried to put down as much stuff whenever we hear about, because a lot of times people make changes in action plans, but they don't think it's connected to assessment or, uh, you know, um, or like weave. They just think it's an improvement. Like a lot of times people don't make the connection. And so within those conversations, I try to encourage people to like put stuff in weave or to identify improvements. Um, but we try to put it in as much as we can. Um, and in Weave, there's really two like action plan sections. Um, there's, there's one that's under like where you put your findings in. And then one, um, I think at the, um, where the, where the learning outcomes are at the top. So we kind of go back and forth on that. Uh, but what we try to do is every year we, we, when we create a new year to put uh, f assessment findings in, we copy a previous year over. So there's action plans could come over. Um, and then we've tried to like work with the faculty and say like, did you do this? You know, did something change? And then kind of update it as we go along from that standpoint. So um, I'm hoping I answered the question. So. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes we do get questions about how those action plans function. And just as a reminder to folks, when you build an action plan, it will automatically carry forward in duplicated projects until you mark the plan as complete. Mm -hmm. And then the next year when you duplicate, that plan won't come forward and you'll be free to create a new one. So just a little tidbit there. So thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to a little bit of conversation about some challenges. It's not that any of this work is done without facing some hurdles on campus. And so we're gonna hear some um, stories and some good strategies and suggestions for facing those challenges. So Dr. DeKing, we'll uh, hear how you're managing challenges at Bon Secours. Sure. Uh, the first challenge here is not getting actionable data from our assessments, right? Uh, Dr. Munen um, mentioned 
um, reviewing alignment between assessment and learning outcomes. Um, I, I'm going to focus a little bit by, uh, you know, on um, uh, support services instead of, uh, uh, you know, educational services or uh, instructional areas. Um, so here is an, something that happens when there's not an alignment between uh, your assessment and uh, your outcomes, your uh, expectations for the services that you, you're providing. A, a good example for me is um, you, uh, on your survey, you talk about, you ask about satisfaction with student services as a whole, but yet you're trying to figure out what happens, you know, with advising or career services, right? Uh, now, once you have those aggregated results, you cannot disaggregate, uh, disaggregate uh, easily. So how do we address this? Um, for units that have new staff or faculty helping out with um, institutional effectiveness or assessment, what we do is we make sure that we review um, the assessment plans before they engage in, collect, uh, in data collection. That helps avoid um, uh, collecting data that yield uh, um, uh, data that's not uh, actionable. Um, then we have competing priorities that many of us here uh, can relate to. We have so much going on. Increasingly, we're being asked to do more with less, right? Uh, and then um, the next one, not everybody takes uh, assessment as seriously as they could. So for those two, what we do, we do have um, champions uh, in the form of leaders uh, that, that are at the cabinet level. Uh, and their task is to make sure that they champion uh, assessment, they champion institutional effectiveness in their respective units to encourage folks there to, to take it as seriously as they could. Next slide, please. So what's working uh, for us? Dr. Monain talked about um, action plans impacting future assessments, right? Um, one thing that we do well is we make sure that our improvement or action plans are um, used in following years uh, assessment. So matter of fact, when we do our annual reviews, the first thing that we do is we look at how previous year action plans were used in following year uh, uh, assessments. Right? Uh, that's what um, most, you know, some people call closing the loop. How was the loop closed with your, you know, with your assessments? Um, the, the, the other thing that we do is we make sure that units that are involved in accrediting and regulatory uh, reporting, that they do include those activities in their assessment so that we do not have them doing duplicative uh, work, right? And lastly, we uh, allow people involved in assessment to provide feedback about how that process is working. That could be uh, from uh, the uh, uh, IE committee or the uh, faculty uh, improvement uh, committee or anybody who's involved in uh, providing data, whether it be uh, uh, through Weave or outside of Weave. Next slide, please. And so what are we doing uh, going forward? Um, we've been doing uh, institutional effectiveness uh, using Weave for the past nine years. And so we feel pretty conf confident that we have a culture of improvement uh, within our institution. So what we are uh, turning our attention to, or our focus to now is to developing a matrix of all accrediting and regulatory requirements um, with unit level responsibilities. That means we, we get all the data points that 
uh, related to accrediting and regulatory reporting on a frequent uh, basis. And we make sure that we track those and we add to that what um, our health system uh, requires, of, requires of us. And, and we track that. So that's the direction we are headed with our IE. So then the next thing that we wanna do is to decide which units will engage uh, in the IE process at that point. And also uh, revise assessment rubrics and ensure that assessments yield actionable data. And lastly, evaluate web, web applications that will um, help us uh, better document our IE processes at that point. On that, I will pause to see if there are any questions for me before I turn it over to Dr. Monet. We do have one that came in. I don't know if everybody could see it in the chat. It might have just been um, for the the hosts and panelists. Um, and it, I'll kind of paraphrase here because I think there's a question um, kind of buried in the comment here about uh, faculty maybe um, not accurately reporting data because they seem to think that not so perfect results reflect negatively on them. And so how do you encourage um, faculty or how do you um, ensure that assessment data isn't being used as a tool um, to reflect negatively on faculty members? Uh, well, we make it clear, we make it clear that it's not going to, and we make sure we don't do that. That's, that's for one. And then, um, we in our institution we make it we also emphasize the fact that a good assessment is not one for which all targets are always met you know a good assessment is you figure out you know making sense of the assessment results if we figure out why is it that we did not meet the targets that we we said in the beginning why is it that we did not meet the learning expectations the learning outcomes that we said in the beginning if we figure that out and decide how to improve that is a successful assessment, even though our targets or benchmarks were not met. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that often institutions struggle a bit with, or faculty struggle a bit with that concept. And I guess maybe to some degree, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? Um, after you've been through some cycles and faculty realize that it's not punitive, hopefully they will continue to engage uh, more um, readily in the process. So, um, Ryan, did you want to comment on that? Are you ready to jump in and tell us a little bit about? Well, I can Jonathan? I can briefly comment on that. I remember when I first came to Regent years ago, I had a faculty member say that to me <clears throat> that they they actually didn't want assessments to be pulled from their courses because they felt if students were struggling that somehow it would look poorly on them. And I said, well, you're actually the only faculty member in this process that it won't look poorly on because curriculum should be a building process. And so when you're assessing the student, then you're, it should be kind of at the end of the program. And so if students are not grasping the concept in that course, it probably means something either wasn't grasped earlier on, and that's why they're struggling at that point. And so we then talked about a curriculum map and how the, the experience of the student should clearly be marked within the curriculum so that if students are struggling in a particular course, you know, for, for assessing the program, then we should be able to look back to see, well, where should the student have learned this and how could we improve those other courses so that the whole burden isn't on that one faculty in that one course to both teach them the concept, the student master it, and then being evaluated. So I'm hoping, my hope is that in that conversation, the faculty members understand that we're assessing at the program level, not the course level. And so that has helped at times as well. Very helpful. Thank you. And it reminds me of Linda Susky in her book, where she mentions that one of the big differences between grading and assessment is that grading is an individual faculty activity, but assessment is something that we engage in jointly and collaboratively at, as you said, the program level. So absolutely. All right, so let's take a look at um, Regent and some of the challenges and um, tools that you've used to overcome those challenges at your institution. Absolutely. So I'll go over uh, briefly four challenges and just our response to those challenges. Um, 
The first one, uh, I don't know about other institutions, but I know Regent there's, has a tendency of having uh, either turnover of faculty and staff or shifting, you know, moving schools, moving programs around. Um, and so when that happens, um, my office is responsible for a lot of the training and the support. And so um, we've, we, over the years, we've tried to do training videos. Um, and so we're trying to get back uh, get back to doing that as well, putting together tutorial videos, kind of like how Weave has their, um, I forget what you call it, Sherry, the knowledge bank or the the, the resource page. You mentioned at the beginning, I apologize. I'm yeah, we here. have the, the knowledge center, yes. The knowledge center, yes. So we're, you know, we would like to do something similar to that where it has, you know, videos, very short, um, brief videos, but also other resources as well, so that when somebody comes on board or a faculty member is assigned a task to help with the assessment, um, or even like a student worker comes on to help with something, we don't always have to do the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, because a lot of times there's one-on-one -on -one meetings is what's bottlenecking this whole process and making the reporting not as efficient and effective as it could be. So if we could offer some automated things, I think that would be helpful. The second uh, challenge, and we've already talked about this a little bit, is just the compliance mindset of I've got this done, let me move on, as opposed to an improvement mindset. And so a few years ago, uh, Keston, if you've been involved with a lot of uh, assessment workshops over the years, Keston from JMU is probably uh, a familiar name. I sat in one of his workshops and he talked about how his uh, assessment process doesn't even have achievement targets because all he wants them to focus on is doing the assessment and then finding ways to improve based off the findings. And so we then tried to work through that on the academic side. And so we created an, a learning improvement plan document that we tried to prioritize the improvement side of it, not necessarily the compliance and the assessment side. And so we're working on trying to address that in order to change the compliance mindset to more of an improvement mindset. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another challenge that we have is what I'm calling over-delegation. Uh, if a faculty member has a really good or, or consistent GA, they tend to over-delegate um, roles and responsibilities to them. And then whenever you know my office is working with them to work on developing an assessment or updating an assignment, there's been times when they've sent the GA to us. So we're like, we can't work with the GA on this. This is a faculty responsibility. So we've actually put together a policy document that says these are things that we can only work with on faculty. And these are things that we can work with on the support staff. And because of that over delegation, it's also created many challenges. So by us creating this culture of us working directly with the faculty member, we're hoping that it addresses uh, those issues. And then finally, the um, very similar uh, to what's already been said about the unrelatable findings. Uh, we want findings that can be linked to marketing, vocational training, specialized accreditation reports. Um, uh, uh, and the more we can do that, the more the findings will be useful. If, if marketing knows, hey, this particular assessment you guys did really good on last year, tell us what, tell us how you did, you know, this year so we can put it in, you know, a publication, faculty are going to be more engaged in doing that because they know their stuff's going to be published. The, the, the last thing I'll say on this is um, one of the issues that we're finding is that findings tend to be, uh, I would say, cut corners. Uh, when people miss deadlines, you know, if, if findings are supposed to be submitted August 1, and we're now in October, November, and they're still not done, our off, my office is like, just give us something and we'll stick it in. Well, giving us something usually don't give us good findings, but it's better than nothing. Um, so one of the, the, one of the big encouragements that I'm trying to work with, like the deans and other people is you need to hit deadline because if we're not hitting deadlines, it's just not missing a deadline. It's also sacrificing the quality of your findings, um, and then makes findings unrelatable. Um, next, next slide, please. So here, here are some, uh, some brief future proposals, um, for improvement. I'm trying to get the EVP to have the deans put some of their improvements of learning in board reports. He's pushing, pushing back against me. So one of the things that he's gonna to try to do is integrate it into um, their annual dean report. So I'm working with him to say, what would that look like and how we get, because the dean basically has to sign something according to what we're talking about. The dean will have to sign something during their annual review to say all the assessments are done and to provide a summary assessment, which I'm hoping carries more weight to help us meet those deadlines that I was just talking about, but trying to get the EVP and the deans 
connected into a process that would then encourage faculty to hit deadlines. Um, I worked with Jordan, you know, who's here with Weave. Um, she gave me the idea of doing a monthly highlight newsletter uh, where I was hoping to try to do it earlier this year, but it looks like maybe this summer we're going to get started where we're going to just interview people across campus on what they're doing from an assessment standpoint and then putting it like a monthly newsletter and sending it out to kind of promote good ideas. Um, integrating Blackboard goals. One of the things that we're finding is that there are times when faculty, even though they upload stuff in the weave, they still need to go back and reevaluate the assessment data from maybe two years ago. Uh, but that's become difficult because maybe someone did it incorrectly in weave and our system doesn't really allow us to go back multiple years. So we're creating ways to cr dashboard and archive things. Um, and then finally, uh, centralizing some assessments, overlapping specialized accreditation practices, um, looking at similar programs, how can we aggregate some of those assessments, some of the assessments together to reduce redundancy. Um, and again, if we can, if faculty members realize that I was doing 20 steps, now I'm only doing 14 because, you know, Ryan's office helped them reduce that. They're more willing to try to hit those goals and focus on quality. Um, and so centralizing that has helped with that. So. Um, so thank you again, this, Sherry, this is all of my slides, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions someone may have. Yeah, so much good information there. And I think we may have to come back for a whole webinar about the um, dashboard highlights and pulling the data from Weave and integrating with Blackboard and all that kind of stuff, because we, we won't have enough time for like- Yes, well, we're still working on that right now. So we probably, that's something we're maybe in the future once we have it in place, but I'm more than happy to, to have that conversation. Yeah, that would be wonderful. So we do have a few minutes for um, some questions. And while you are all kind of thinking for a minute, um, I will throw in, I, I'm at no loss to ask questions if you all can't think of any. So I'll just come up with my own. But um, uh, Dr. DeKing, you mentioned about doing a meta-analysis of your assessment process, which is something that we hear quite frequently from folks and is a really important part of the assessment process, like looking back and saying, okay, what, what's working in our cycle and what's working in our process. Do you have a rubric or tool that you use to do that process that you'd like to talk about for a second? Sure, and, and, and it's simple. We do have a rubric. Uh, IE process does have a rubric that we follow. If you uh, recall, my last slide was about, you know, uh, adjusting our rubric once we figure out what direction, what changes we're going to make to our current assessment process. So annually when um, the, uh, the IE committee and the program improvement, com the faculty program improvement committee come together to do uh, the reviews of all the IE plans or assessment plans from different units, including ac academic units from the institution. They do use a rubric to um, uh, assess, to, you know, to rate each um, IE plan. Yes. Wonderful, thank you. And so I'll ask another question. Um, for both of you, if you are willing to put your email address in the chat in case anyone wants to reach out to you um, to ask further questions or to share those resources with folks, um, that would be great. Um, so I just volunteered you in front of everybody, no pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, uh... yeah, I'll say that from, from my perspective, when I stepped into my role 10 years ago at an institution, and I had education background, but did not have um, formal training as an assessment professional, and this was exactly the kind of thing that I found so valuable is engaging in um, some webinars, as a matter of fact, some of them were weave webinars, um, some professional organizations and hearing people say, oh yeah, we have a rubric for that. And they were willing to share those tools with me that I could take and adjust um, at my institution so that we could do some of that same good work. So I'm sure folks are appreciative of anything that you're willing to share. Um, if we, I'm checking to see if we have any other questions in chat or the q and I don't see anything popping up there. 
Um, I'm going to uh, just give a couple of pieces of information about Weave, and then I'm going to come back to you both. So a little primer here, um, Dr. Renee and Dr. DeKing, like your last, like, here's the one thing every assessment professional should know or do, maybe a resource. That can everybody can I ask Dr. DeKing a question? Since oh, he's please. more yeah. over the, oh, sure. uh, yes. um, like the facility side. So a lot of times when I'm working with the assessment with facilities, IT, other people, they have the learning, they have the objectives and goals. And we say, we need you to identify an assessment to measure the effectiveness of it. And their response is, we assess things all the time. We have you know hundreds of assessments to evaluate the effectiveness of what we're doing. Um, maybe, maybe they don't have hundreds, but they have probably more than what we would put, wanna put into Weave. What advice or what guidance do you give to somebody to kind of central or to simplify or to kind of not be overwhelmed or overbearing with a unit? I don't, maybe they don't say that to you, but that's what they say to me. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. Are, what, are, what are some, I know what we do, but I would love to hear what you guys do um, over there. Sure. That's an interesting question. Uh, so, so I will share this story for, you know, prior to being where I am at the College of Nursing and at Bon Secours, I was at the College of William & Mary doing the same kind of work. So, so w w my, my first boss at William & Mary would say uh, to, that, to that question or to that comment, so how do you know that you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, to, to do in your respective areas? Right? How do you know? Right? And then he would say, okay, if you have hundreds of things, break it down to, you know, for, for the, uh, the lay, uh, uh, lay uh, layman, break it down for the layman and break it down in chunks. Let's say uh, this year you focus on three to five objectives. You know, if you have more than that, just focus on three to five objectives, just um, use that and show at the end how you know at the end of that year that you've achieved what you said you were going to achieve as simple as that i didn't realize you were at william and mary i think i know who your boss is and i highly respect her <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we do something very similar we do what i try to do is i say okay instead of focusing on the assessment you know tell me your four or five big improvements that you made this last year and then tell me what assessments you did that led to those um, so, it, because they're more likely to discuss all the improvements that they made rather than all the assessments that they did. Uh, but it sounds like very similar to what, what you guys are doing there as well. Yes. Good. Thank you. That's an excellent question and really um, prime because we have so many folks who, even though they've been doing good academic assessment for a long time, this administrative assessment piece has kind of been the, you know, the thorn in their side for a little while and are trying to get a handle on that. So um, good question there. Um, I have up on the screen uh, for anyone who's interested, if you've got your phone handy and you want to grab that QR code, that will take you to a page where you can sign up to receive notifications about more events like this and other things that are in our Knowledge Center. We do have um, a podcast that we've launched at the beginning of 2022, and you can get notifications about our podcast. Um, so sign up for those things. We would love to see you in some other events. And if you're on this call and you're not familiar with Weave's tools, um, Dr. Murnane was really nice to mention some of those pieces and Dr. DeKing talking about the action planning. And so um, if you're not familiar and you'd like more information, uh, just reach out. We'd be happy to show you a demonstration of Weave's capabilities. And with that, I will give a final um, huge thank you to both Dr. Murnane and Dr. DeKing for providing some great assessment stories and some expertise about what we can do to make use of hard one assessment data that's collected so that it's not just uh, going into the black hole out there. So thank you to you both. Thank you for our all of our guests that joined us today. Um, and you will receive the recording of this to share around campus after, <clears throat> excuse me, after the webinar um, is finished processing and Jordan gets a chance to send that out to you. So, um, all right, so uh, one minute each your one piece of uh, advice for the assessment professional. I can, I can start. Um, 
So I would just say this. I'll start with my William and Mary story. At William and Mary, we called our um, institutional effectiveness process PI, process um, of institutional effectiveness PI. Um, and and if you were to request a res- you know, some resources for your department, you had to you had to use your PI to submit what they call PBR, uh, planning and budget requests, and if you didn't have pie, um, solid, a solid pie, you couldn't tie your PBR, your planning and budget request to your pie, right? So I'm saying that to go back to that quote that I said earlier from Dr. Debetan quote, assessment should be a way for us to tell the story of what we've been doing, right? If you don't do that, you're not going to have a seat at the table. You're not going to be able to tell a convincing story that will allow you to get more uh, resources for your department, for your unit, for yourself. So that would be my my best advice. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm hopeful that you actually gave people pie, at least on some occasions. (laughs) More than that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, I'll just I'll add to that because I'm in complete agreement with that. Um, My thing is going to my encouragement is simply going to be. Um, find the individuals in your institutions with the social capital to make things happen and build those relationships. Um, because a dean might be, you know, may not have the social capital in a particular area. Uh, and it might be an administrative assistant, or it might be a faculty member who used to be a dean. Uh, find out who, who, you know, those social capitalists are and start building those relationships. Because when priorities as uh, Dr. DeKang, you know, talked about competing priorities. When that starts happening, you want to be able to call on your the people you have relationships with to try to get things done. And so that would be my one minute of encouragement is to try to um, identify the people you need to connect with and start working, start networking. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There have been some thank yous coming in in the chat. I hope that you saw those. We appreciate your time and expertise and hope everyone has a uh, very good end of the school year as it's winding down here. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.